The Outsiders, Chapter 7, Part 2 You would have thought it had been five years instead of five days since I'd seen him last, but I didn't mind. I liked old Two-Bit. He's a good buddy to have. He spun me into Steve, who gave me a playful slap on my bruised back and shoved me across the room. One of the eggs went flying. It landed on the clock, and I tightened my grip on the other one so that it crushed and ran all over my hand. Now look what you did, I griped. There went our breakfast. Can't you two wait till I set the eggs down before you go shoving me all over the country? I really was a little mad because I had just realized how long it had been since I'd eaten anything. The last thing I'd eaten was a hot fudge sundae at the Dairy Queen in Windricksville, and I was hungry. Tubit was walking in a slow circle around me, and I sighed because I knew what was coming. Man, dig baldy here. He was staring at my head as he circled me. I wouldn't have believed it. I thought all the wild Indians in Oklahoma had been tamed. What little squaws got that tough-looking mop of yours, pony boy? Ah, oh, lay off, I said. I wasn't feeling too good in the first place, kind of like I was coming down with something. Two-Bit winked at Steve, and Steve said, Why, well, he had to get a haircut to get his picture in the paper. They'd never believe a greasy-looking mug could be a hero. How do you like being a hero, big shot? How do I like what? Being a hero, you know. He shoved the morning paper at me impatiently, like, like a big shot, even. I stared at the newspaper. On the front page of the second section was the headline, Juvenile Delinquents Turn Heroes. What I like is the turn bit, Two Bit said, cleaning the eggs up off the floor. Y'all were heroes from the beginning. You didn't just turn all of a sudden. I hardly heard him. I was reading the paper. That whole page was covered with stories about us, the fight, the murder, the church burning, the socias being drunk, everything. My picture was there with dairy and soda pop. The article told Johnny how Johnny and I had risked our lives saving those little kids, and there was a comment from one of the parents who said they would have all burned to death if it hadn't been for us. It told the whole story of our fight with the Socias, only they didn't say Socias, because most grown-ups don't know about the battles that go on between us. They had interviewed Cherry Valance, and she said Bob had been drunk and that the boys had been looking for a fight when they took her home. Bob had told her he'd fix us for picking up his girl. His buddy Randy Anderson, who had helped jump us, also said it was their fault, and that they'd only fought back in self-defense. But they were charging Johnny with manslaughter. Then I discovered that I was supposed to appear at juvenile court for running away, and Johnny was too if he recovered. Not if, I thought again. Why do they keep seeing if? For once there weren't any charges against Dally, and I knew he'd be mad because the paper made him out a hero for saving Johnny, and didn't say much about his police record, which he was kind of proud of. He'd kill those reporters if he got a hold of them. There was another column about just Derry and Soda and me, how Derry worked on two jobs at once and made good at both of them, and about his outstanding record at school. It mentioned Soda Pop dropping out of school so we could stay together, and that I made the honor roll at school all the time <clears throat> and might be a future track star. Oh yeah, I forgot. I'm on the A-Squad track team, the youngest one. I'm a good runner. Then it said we shouldn't be separated after we had worked so hard to stay together. The meaning of that last line finally hit me. You mean, I swallowed hard, that they're thinking about putting me and Soda in a boy's home or something? Steve was carefully combing back his hair in complicated swirls. Something like that. <clears throat> I sat down in a daze. We couldn't get hauled off now. Not after me and Derry had finally got through to each other, and now that the big rumble was coming up and we would settle this Soch greaser thing once and for all. Not now when Johnny needed us and Dally was still in the hospital and wouldn't be out for the rumble. No, I said out loud, and Two-Bit, who was scraping the egg off the clock, turned to stare at me. No what? No, they ain't going to put us in boys' home. Don't worry about it, Steve said, cocksure that he and Soda Pop could handle anything that came up. They don't do things like that to heroes. We're Soda and Superman. That was as far as he got, because Derry, shaved and dressed, came in behind Steve and lifted him up off the floor, then dropped him. We all called Derry Superman, or Muscles, at one time or another, but one time Steve made the mistake of referring to him as all brawn and no brain, and Derry almost shattered Steve's jaw. Steve didn't call him that again, but Derry never forgave him. Derry has never really gotten over not going to college. That was the only time I've ever seen Soda mad at Steve, although Soda attaches no importance to education. School bored him, no action. Soda came running in. Where's that blue shirt I washed yesterday? He took a swig of chocolate milk out of the container. Hate to tell you, buddy, Steve said, still flat on the floor. But you have to wear clothes to work. There's a law or something. Oh, yeah, Soda said. <clears throat> Where's those wheat jeans, too? I ironed. They're in my closet, Derry said. Hurry up. You're going to be late. Soda ran back, muttering, I'm hurrying. I'm hurrying. Steve followed him, and in a second, there was the general racket of a pillow fight. 
I absentmindedly watched Darius. He searched the ice box for chocolate cake. Darius said suddenly, did you know about the juvenile court? Without turning to look at me, he said evenly, yeah, the cops told me last night. I knew then he realized we might get separated. I didn't want to worry about him anymore, but I said, I had one of those dreams last night, the one I can't ever remember. Derry spun around to face me, genuine fear on his face. What? I had a nightmare the night of mom and dad's funeral. I'd had nightmares and wild dreams every once in a while when I was little, but nothing like this one. I woke up screaming bloody murder, and I never could remember what it was that had scared me. It scared Soda Pop and Derry almost as bad as it scared me. For night after night, for weeks on end, I would dream this dream and wake up in a cold sweater screaming, and I could never remember exactly what happened in it. Soda began sleeping with me, and it stopped recurring so often, but it happened often enough for Derry to take me to a doctor. The doctor said I had too much imagination. He had a simple cure, too. Study harder, read more, draw more, and play football more. After a hard game of football and four or five hours of reading, I was too exhausted, mentally and physically, to dream anything. But Derry never got over it, and every once in a while he would ask me if I ever dreamed anymore. Was it very bad, too big questioned? He knew the whole story, and having never dreamed about anything but blondes, he was interested. No, I lied. I had awakened in a cold sweat and shivering, but Soda was dead to the world. I had just wiggled closer to him and stayed awake for a couple of hours, trembling under his arm. That dream always scared the heck out of me. Derry started to say something, but before he could begin, Soda Pop and Steve came in. You know what, Soda Pop said to no one in particular? When we stomp the so she's good, me and Steve here are going to throw a big party, and everyone can get stoned. Then we'll go chase the socials clear to Mexico. Where are you going to get the dough, little man? Derry had found the cake and was handing out pieces. I'll think of something, Soda Pop assured him between bites. You going to take Sandy to the party, I asked, just to be saying something? Instant silence. I looked around. What's the deal? Soda Pop was staring at his feet, but his ears were reddening. No. She went to live with her grandmother in Florida. How come? Look, Steve said, surprisingly angry. Does he have to draw you a picture? It was either that or get married, and her parents almost hit the roof at the idea of her marrying a 16-year-old kid. 17, Soda said softly. I'll be 17 in a couple of weeks. Oh, I said embarrassed. Soda was no innocent. I had been in on both sessions, and his bragging was as loud as anyone's, but never about Sandy, not ever about Sandy. I remembered how her blue eyes had glowed when she looked at him, and I was sorry for her. There was a heavy silence, then Derry said, We better get on to work, Pepsi-Cola. Derry rather rarely called Soda by Dad's pet nickname for him, but he did so then because he knew how miserable Soda Pop was about Sandy. I hate to leave you here by yourself, pony boy, Derry said slowly. Maybe I ought to take the day off. I stayed by my lonesome before. You can't afford a day off. Yeah, but you just got back and I really ought to stay. I'll babysit him, Two Bit said, ducking as I took a swing at him. I haven't got anything better to do. Why don't you get a job, Steve said. Ever consider working for a living? Work, Two-Bit was aghast, and ruin my rep. I wouldn't be babysitting the kid here if I knew of some good day nursery open on Saturdays. I pulled his chair over backward and jumped on him, but he had me down in a second. I was kind of short on wind. I've got to cut out smoking or I won't make track next year. Holler, Uncle. Nope, I said, struggling, but I didn't have my usual strength. Derry was pulling on his jacket. You two do up the dishes. You can go to the movies if you want to before you go see Dally and Johnny. He paused for a second, watching Two-Bit squash the heck out of me. Two-Bit lay off. He ain't looking so good. Pony boy, you take a couple of aspirins and go easy. You smoke more than a pack today and I'll skin you, understand? Yeah, I said, getting to my feet. You carry more than one bundle of roofing at a time today and me and Soda will skin you, understood? He grinned one of his rare grins. Yeah, see y'all this afternoon. Bye, I said. I heard our Ford's vroom and thought, Soda's driving, and they left. Anyway, I was walking around downtown and started to take this shortcut through an alley. Tupit was telling me about one of his many exploits while we did the dishes. I mean, while I did the dishes. He was sitting on the cabinet, sharpening that black-handled switchblade he was so proud of. And I ran into these three guys. I says, howdy, and they just look at each other. Then one says, we would jump you, but since you're as slick as us, we figure you don't have nothing worth taking. I says, buddy, that's the truth, and went right on. Moral. What's the safest thing to be when one is met by a gang of social outcasts in an alley? A judo expert, I suggested. No, another social outcast, Tubit yelped, and I nearly fell off the cabinet from laughing so hard. I had to grin, too. He saw things straight and made them into something funny. We're going to clean up the house, I said. The reporters or police or somebody might come by. And anyway, it's time for those guys from the state to come by and check up on us. 
This house ain't messy. You ought to see my house. I have. And if you had the sense of a billy goat, you'd try to help around your place instead of bumming around. Shoot, kid, if I ever did that, my mom would die of shock. I like Two Bits' mother. She had the same good humor and easygoing ways that he did. She wasn't lazy like him, but she let him get away with murder. I don't know, though. It's just about impossible to get mad at him. When we had finished, I pulled on Dally, Dally's brown leather jacket. The, the back was burned black, and we started for 10th Street. I would drive us, Two Bits said as we walked up the street, trying to thumb a ride. But the brakes are out of my car. Almost killed me and Kathy the other night. He flipped the collar of his black leather jacket up to serve as a windbreak while he lit a cigarette. You ought to see Kathy's brother. Now there's a hood. He's so greasy he glides when he walks. He goes to the barber for an oil change, not a haircut. I would have laughed, but I had a terrific headache. We stopped at the Tasty Freeze to buy Cokes and rest up, and the blue Mustang that had been trailing us for eight blocks pulled in. I almost decided to run, and Two-Bit must have guessed this, for he shook his head ever so slightly and tossed me a cigarette. As I lit up, the Soches, who had jumped Johnny and me at the park, hopped out of the Mustang. I recognized Randy Adderson, Marsha's boyfriend, and the tall guy that had almost drowned me. I hated them. It was their fault Bob was dead. Their fault Johnny was dying. Their fault Soda and I might get put in a boy's home. I hated them as bitterly and contemptuously as Dally Winston hated. Tupit put an elbow on my shoulder and leaned against me, dragging on his cigarette. You know the rules. No jazz before the rumble, he said to the Soches. We know, Randy said. He looked at me. Come here, I want to talk to you. I glanced at Tubit. He shrugged. I followed Randy over to his car out of earshot of the rest. We sat there in his car for a second silently. Golly, that was the toughest car I've ever been in. I read about you in the paper, Randy said finally. How come? I don't know. Maybe I felt like playing hero. I wouldn't have. I would have let those kids burn to death. You might not have. You might, you might have done the same thing. Randy pulled out a cigarette and pressed the car lighter. I don't know. I don't know anything anymore. I would never have believed a greaser could pull something like that. Greaser didn't have anything to do with it. My buddy over there wouldn't have done it. Maybe you wouldn't have done the same thing. Maybe a friend of yours wouldn't have. It's the individual. I'm not going to show at the rumble tonight, Randy said slowly. I took a good look at him. He was 17 or so, but he was already old. Like Dallas was old. Cherry had said her friends were too cool to feel anything. And yet she could remember watching sunsets. Randy was supposed to be too cool to feel anything, and yet there was pain in his eyes. I'm sick of all this, sick and tired. Bob was a good guy. He was the best buddy a guy ever had. I mean, he was a good fighter and tough and everything, but he was a real person too, you dig? I nodded. He's dead. His mother has had a nervous breakdown. They spoiled him rotten. I mean, most parents would be proud of a kid like that, good looking and smart and everything, but they gave in to him all the time. He kept trying to make someone say no, and they never did. They never did. That was what he wanted, for somebody to tell him no, to have somebody lay down the law, set the limits, give him something solid to stand on. That's what we all want, really. One time, Randy tried to grin, but I could tell he was close to tears. One time he came home drunker than anything. He thought, sure, they were going to raise the roof. You know what they did? They thought it was something they'd done. They thought it was their fault. They'd failed him and driven him to it or something. They took all the blame and didn't do anything to him. If this old man had just belted him just once, he might still be alive. I don't know why I'm telling you this. I couldn't tell anyone else. My friends, they think I was off my rocker or turning soft. Maybe I am. I just know that I'm sick of this whole mess. That kid, your buddy, the one that got burned, he might die? Yeah, I said, trying not to think about Johnny. And tonight, people get hurt in rumbles, maybe killed. I'm sick of it because it doesn't do any good. You can't win. You know that, don't you? And when I remained silent, he went on. You can't win even if you whip us. You'll still be where you were before, at the bottom. And we'll still be the lucky ones with all the breaks. So it doesn't do any good, the fighting and the killing. It doesn't prove a thing. We'll forget if you win or if you don't. Greasers will still be greasers and socias will still be socias. Sometimes I think it's the ones in the middle that are really the lucky stiffs. He took a deep breath. So I'd fight if I thought it'd do any good. I think I'm going to leave town. Take my little old Mustang and all the dough I can carry and get out. Running away won't help. Oh, hell, I know it, Randy half sobbed. But what can I do? I'm Mark Chicken if I punk out at the rumble, and I'd hate myself if I didn't. I don't know what to do. I'd help you if I could, I said. I remembered Cherry's voice. Things are rough all over. I knew then what she meant. He looked at me. No, you wouldn't. I'm a soche. You get a little money, and the whole world hates you. No, I said. You hate the whole world. He just looked at me. From the way he looked, he could have been ten years older than he was. I got out of the car. 
You would have saved those kids if you had been there, I said. You'd have saved them the same as we did. Thanks, Grease, he said, trying to grin. Then he stopped. I didn't mean that. I mean, thanks, kid. My name's Pony Boy, I said. Nice talking to you, Randy. I walked over to Tubit, and Randy honked for his friends to come and get into the car. What do you want, Tubit asked. What did Mr. Super Soch have to say? He ain't a Soch, I said. He's just a guy. He wanted to talk. You want to see a movie before we go see Johnny in Dallas? Nope, I said, lining up another weed. I still had a headache, but I felt better. Soches were just guys, after all. Things were rough all over, but it was better that way. That way you could tell the other guy was human, too.